So it's fitting that we're here today at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, I took a walk this morning when I arrived here a little bit early to take a look through the museum. And Twain was uh, not only an innovator in terms of writing style, the stories, the classic, the great American novels, but he was also a patent holder. He was an inventor. And uh, he also <coughs> invested heavily, and I do mean heavily, uh, money to that today would be in multi-millions of dollars, into a variety of ventures, uh, most of which failed miserably. But he was keenly interested in technology, keenly interested in innovation, so it's altogether fitting that uh, we have the TEDx event here today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is innovation in, in a different realm, and that of electronics. So it's the, uh, the ubiquitous smartphones that we carry with us, our Androids, our iPhones, and so forth. It's everything that we uh, carry and wear, our computing devices, uh, and much more today. What we're trying to do is look at ways to reshape that in ways that are more fitting for humans so that we can wear them uh, on our bodies in a transparent manner so that we're not stuck with the traditional uh, rigid boxes that electronics comes packaged in today. And so if we look at... Um, sorry. There we go. So if we look at uh, these devices that we carry with us, they all share some common characteristics. Specifically, they're rigid, they're brittle, and inside of each of these devices, if we carve them open, we'll find a variety of little components. They look like small black boxes, typically, inside of which are uh, small bits of silicon, and that silicon powers everything that we uh, do with computing today, our internet, uh, the computers we sit in front of, the mainframes that run in the background, uh, and provide a lot of the functionality that we need in our daily lives today. We didn't know we needed it until we started using it. But all of these features we take advantage of today are based on these electronic devices. What doesn't work so well is coupling the, these devices, although they're getting smaller and thinner every year. There's new innovations, uh, new phones come out with new features on them, uh, but they still uh, resemble the hard boxes that we've uh, been used to for many years. However, if we look at humans, we're actually fairly soft materials, right? We have skin, we have muscle, we have tissue, and the, and the electronics doesn't couple well. Just a few weeks ago, I was trying out a, I'm a very early adopter on the technical side, so I tend to go out and buy a lot of gadgets and try them out. Uh, I was trying out a new health fitness system that coupled to a, 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 basically a smartphone. It uh, had wires leading to sensors that went on the body, specifically in the ears. And I found as I was riding my bike and gauging this that I was very dissatisfied with this. I had this thing on my arm that was bouncing up and down as I was going over uh, potholes. Um, I had wires that were moving. Uh, it wasn't seamless and it wasn't transparent. It was, it was there and it was intrusive, in fact. In fact, by the end of the ride, I tore it out and I, I will never use it again. <laughs> um, so, so things go, but you learn. And so if we had systems that could mold to the body in a conformal way that would be far more attractive to in the ways we use devices today. It would allow us to be more uh, tightly coupled with these devices and use them in ways that are not obtrusive. Uh, furthermore, if you look at medical devices, people are often putting monitors on their body or checking temperatures, blood pressures, and so forth. All of these, all of these devices share similar characteristics in that they're typically hard and bulky. Some of them are nicely designed. Uh, some of them are relatively easy to use, but many aren't. And it would be nice, especially if you have, uh, uh, you're trying to diagnose something, for example, over a longer period of time, it would be nice to have something more than that. And so if we take a look at uh, a new form of electronics that we're really trying to, uh, what we're trying to do is reshape how electronics are used, where essentially what we're trying to do is free electronics from what is called the wafer, upon which all electronics are made. Everything you own that's electronic at some point today is now formed upon uh, silicon wafers. And we can do much more than that. We can take these devices and thin them to a point where they're a small fraction of the diameter of a human hair. We can embed those in rubber-like materials, polymers, silicones, and make them as thin as a bandage or, or less. We can also then take those devices and put them in uh, other materials so that they can then uh, attach to the body directly. And uh, we can also, as part of that, we have to be able to transfer the devices that we're making onto these materials. So we create interconnects. These are form the elements of a circuit. We create the silicon. We add those to that circuit. Uh, we can then package it. 
And then finally, we can uh, uh, add devices that allow all of these things to interconnect to power and I.O., which essentially means can we talk to it? Can we communicate and get data off of it? Can we put that data perhaps in your smartphone, perhaps on your computer, perhaps in the network in the sky in the, in the cloud? And we are doing that. So today we have systems where we're thinning whole wafers. I'll show you an example here. A traditional silicone wafer is a rigid material. It's about 750 microns, maybe up almost a millimeter thick. Uh, it's rigid. It's like glass. If I drop this, it will shatter and, and basically turn into small shards of glass. But we can now thin these today to the point where they're as flexible as paper or more. This is 10 microns thick. In fact, the adhesive tape holding the chips here is thicker than the chips themselves. So we're now able to take these materials, thin them to a point where they're a tiny fraction of the thickness of a human hair, but still have all of the requisite electronics on them due to the processing and the sensing and actuation in some cases. And so that's an example where we're thinning the materials to a point where now we can start to think about what we put those materials in. Secondly, we have concepts where we can embed these materials so that even when they're bent, so if I take a, a piece of wood or a, a piece of metal and a beam and I bend it and I move that downward, what happens in the bottom of that beam, it gets tighter, it goes into compression. The top of that beam goes into tension, it actually opens up. But the middle of that beam has, experiences no stress at all. It's a very classic civil engineering concept. It's the way bridges are designed. You're trying to reduce stresses. If we embed electronics at that middle point in that beam, in that composite laminate sandwich of materials, we can also reduce or eliminate stresses in that material. That means our once fragile glass silicon uh, materials will not, will not fracture, will not break, and can be, in fact, quite reliable. So the idea of thinning and then embedding uh, is a very powerful one and allows us to do much more. Now, if we want to take traditional silicon or we want to make our own, and we've, we've done that, we've been able to build a variety of circuits. We build them in traditional computer fabs, thin them down, slice them up, and then interlink them to form circuits and complex systems. But additionally, we'll have to take those very, very small chiplets now, which have never been handled before in industry. They're so thin that to pick them up in a traditional manner, we'll just simply crack them, right? the typical tips that are used for that. So we ha had to invent an entirely new form of printing uh, called mi a microtransfer, which uses viscoelastic stamps. These are essentially sticky materials that you can drop down on something and pick it up. It's like taking a piece of tape and using that to pick up something small and light. The interesting thing about this is that if I pick it up slowly, it'll remain. I then put it, take it from the, the mother wafer, if you will, the mother subs, and then put it on a destination substrate. And if I lift it off quickly, it'll remain. So you're using a difference in these accelerations and forces in order to pick it up off of something and put it on to something else. And so this enables us to start to piece together all of these elements in these very thin uh, circuits. Finally, another, uh, the third fundamental idea of this, besides thinning and embedding, and then creating the uh, transfer process, is that of making designs and geometries that allow you to flex. And it's akin to that of a, a, a common slinky or a spring, where the steel materials are not bending to their plastic limit, beyond which that deformation remains. If you bend something far enough, like a paper clip, it will in fact stay in that position. But if you bend it slightly, it'll come back. It's an elastic property. Similarly with silicon materials and metal materials that we use in our systems, we can create designs that look like serpentine uh, snake-like uh, uh, paths. Uh, we can create buckling interconnects that are like the uh, um, elements in a pop-up book that will uh, open up and then uh, collapse back together. Uh, so with the advent of these designs, we can now connect these devices, integrate them into a common platform, stretch them, and then release them, and they'll go back to their normal shape. So this combination of I three I fundamental ideas allows us now to create circuits with properties that none have er ever had before. And so you end up with strange, interesting forms like this, where you have islands of silicon with uh, processors and sensors and devices connected by these interconnects, which can stretch and flex. Very similar to if you cut something out of paper that looked like this, it would behave in a very similar manner. Uh, these devices bend without breaking, but they're doing this at an incredibly small scale. And so you can start to construct more interesting things. So what would you do with this? You can make arrays of LEDs. You can create flexible, conformal lighting systems. You can put this on your skin. 
You can do a wide variety of things. Here's an example of what we call the BioStamp. The BioStamp is an electronic device. In this case, embodies all three of the elements that I just showed you. It, sh it shows the wavy interconnects. It shows the ultra-thin metallized layers. It shows elements of computer chips that have been microtransferred from one place to another on this circuit. And the overall thickness of this whole circuit is on the order of 50 microns or less. In fact, very often around 20 microns. Again, the diameter of a human hair is around 100 microns. So you can see how thin these systems can be. And these biostamps can include a wide variety of sensing. This was done as an example to show different functionalities in the same device. Temperature, an LED, wireless power transfer, strain gauges. I can take, uh, ex I can take measurements of electrical activity beneath the skin. We can put this all in. In fact, I'm wearing one right now that I put on just a few minutes ago. It operates just like an adhesive bandage. I can put it on. And then I can communicate it with it. I can use a smartphone with certain features enabled, like NFC, near-field communication, which is becoming very, very common. I predict by the end of next year, most phones will have NFC built into them. And that will allow us to communicate with these things, in some cases, even power them. They're mostly be being made now for transaction purposes, so you can do wireless payments. But we foresee a future in which you can also now do health monitoring and other things. So very powerful ideas and concepts. We can also print these materials to anything. It doesn't have to be just skin, although that's a great uh, application, we believe, to put electronics on the body, and in some cases, as I'll show you, inside the body. But we can print to leather materials, paper materials, and others. Uh, we can also put interventional devices to use by wrapping uh, devices like catheters, which are uh, devices used to go, in, for example, into the femoral artery, up into the heart, to do measurements of electrical activity in the heart to correct things like cardiac arrhythmias. And these are typically done in a way that are, in some sense, blind, where you go in, you often have x-ray uh, during the uh, operation. Uh, you do some form of ablation, which is to kill tissue and prevent these arrhythmias from happening. And once you do that, then if successful, then you can retract the catheter, and then you're, uh, you're much better off uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, what we're able to do is in introduce electronics at the far end of these catheters, which can perform a wide series of measurements that they aren't able to do today, and we can do it in one procedure instead of two. So these types of medical devices can be enhanced by the incorporation of ultra-thin electronics at the far end of these systems. Similarly, we can take wearable electronics in the form of not just wristbands. There are many out there now. There's uh, quite a few on the market. I've bought several, tried them out, not entirely satisfied with them. We're trying to make it better. Uh, we're trying to learn from what, uh, certainly what others are doing, but uh, trying to improve on that tremendously as well. And to be able to go from bracelets that measure activity and heart rate and, and much more than that to bio stamps like this, which can do the same thing, but be under your shirt and not be visible, not be a bulky uh, handicap, in essence, to uh, moving around in your daily life. We've also been working on a number of uh, devices that can be applied directly to uh, epicardial applications on the surface of the heart, where we can do direct measurements on the surface of a beating heart, to the point where we're able to do that and put electrodes on the end of these catheters, as I just described. But also, we can take tactile sensors. So this is a human finger with tactile sensors on the tip of it touching a beating heart. And we're actually able to look at the patterns of force in that heart while it's beating uh, during surgery. And these, there's a lot of very interesting clinical uses for this, and we're just beginning to explore those now. This is a fascinating example for me because it, it really shows the transition of this electronics to providing data, which is transformed into information. And that chain of events here uh, provides a new picture, a new image of what's going on in the body. So we're able to take a series of um, electrode arrays, uh, sometimes passive, sometimes active, place them directly on the heart, either in, inside the heart through access in the same way catheters come in, or external to the heart. We're able to place that on there and get a wide number of electrograms. This is the typical signal that you see when you uh, see activity in the heart, but typically you see one or two. Some surgeons use three or four uh, during the course of a surgery, but we can provide thousands. And what that means is it's too much information for anyone to absorb, even visually, directly. But if you create a uh, visual image by combining all of those and turn those into pixels, 
as shown here on the right-hand side, then you're able to get an image of what's happening on the surface of the heart. You can actually see electrical waves propagating across the heart. And what does that tell the doctors? Well, they're learning now that there are all sorts of interesting features that are going on, features like rotors and other things, where the electrical signals, uh, especially with arrhythmias, can be corrected by applying uh, more judicious uh, surgical techniques to ablate certain areas of the tissue rather than trying to obliterate everything in the region. Uh, so with the cure being worse than the disease occasionally, this is a, a very good feature to have. In general, across the body, what we're trying to do is seamless sensing. We're trying to provide a variety of things across the body in very thin and transparent devices, able to do EMGs, heart rate, uh, activity, uh, gait and weight distribution, which is of great interest in, in many fields right now, uh, UV, SPF, and so forth. And some of these devices that we're building are, are providing some really key insights into the way the body works. Two or three years ago, we started with this simple set of electrodes. We wrapped this around a catheter. We put it into uh, animals for testing. We had some very good results, very promising results. And then over the years, we've begun to build more and more complex devices, incorporating more and more active electronics, even batteries in some cases, ultra-thin, ultra-small batteries that can power electronics for some period of time. Uh, hydration sensors, which are able to measure the hydration of the skin. Uh, we want to go deeper than that. We want to understand what's going on uh, within the body as well. We also have been looking at a variety of monitoring. We're now incorporating whole architectures which look uh, at a fundamental level, at a block level, like a computer. We have a processor, you have sensors, you have memory devices, you have batteries and so forth. Eventually, we believe we'll be able to have the laptop on a, on a Band-Aid, essentially, that we'll be able to put the power of that in something that can sit on the skin or just below the skin and provide a great deal of information. What this potentially means is a seismic shift away from having to do a physical once a year and getting a few discrete data points over time over the course of the years. You can chart your weight, you can chart your blood pressure, you can chart a few other things. But what you don't see are all the patterns that emerge in the middle. If we can do that on a more continuous basis, maybe it's monthly, maybe it's weekly, maybe it's daily, hourly, we can do it to the second. So you have a continuous time history of what's going on. There's a, a movement afoot now called the quantified self movement. You may have seen this, where people are taking an active role in their life and monitoring what it is they're doing. And we believe that this type of innovation in the electronics world can help that and make that happen even faster. And so these devices that we're now testing, and uh, every week in our very small company, we have people testing all sorts of things. They're going on bike rides, we're running, swimming, uh, playing football, and so forth, just to test these things out. And there's uh, quite a few things to come. And there's a lot more to do. And we don't even own the whole system, right? We don't have all of these elements. The, the software that goes in the smartphones, the, the, uh, the data links to the cloud, the trending analysis, and so forth. These are very powerful concepts. We're focused on getting that information in the first place, and that's what we want to do. So to conclude, we're really trying to enable uh, body-centric sensing, both in the body uh, and inside the body, and link that to a much, to be able to provide information that has much deeper meaning than simply having that particular data. Data by itself is insufficient. You need some way of taking that, turning it into inf information, and then a diagnosis or, or something else. Thank you.